and welcome to our third episode of the Brand Bewitchery series as I take you through each chapter of my guidebook to help you wield the story cycle system to craft spellbinding stories for your brand. I'm Park Howell, host of the Business of Story, and today you will learn about the third step in the story cycle called stakes. You will learn how to truly understand what your customers wish for and want from your product or service so that your brand will become the most timely and relevant offering for your prospects. If you've been following this series, then you heard the first two chapters covered in episodes 420 and 421. Last week, we inserted a special edition in the series with special guest, Henner Gracie, the grandson of Brazilian jiu-jitsu creator Helio Gracie and founder of Gracie University that shares the art of jiu-jitsu with the world. We discussed his new book, The 32 Principles, Harnessing the Power of Jiu-Jitsu to Succeed in Business, Relationships, and Life. Given that I've always believed that leadership storytelling is the jiu-jitsu of business communications, I couldn't resist having Henner on the show to demonstrate how his 32 principles apply beautifully to brand, sales, and marketing communications to make all of your messages more powerful. I even wrote a post that covers the 32 jiu-jitsu principles of leadership and business storytelling, the link for which you can find in the show notes. For instance, jiu-jitsu principle number 12 that Henner calls the reconnaissance principle is a great example for this episode as you do the recon on the wishes and wants of your customers. Here it is. If you're going to be successful on the jiu-jitsu mat, you would better know your opponent's tendencies, right? Legendary Hollywood script guru Robert McKee said that every screenwriter has to know their audience in a godlike way. So they too have to use the reconnaissance principle to understand what motivates them, what drives them, what's of interest to them. The same is true in business. One of the best ways to learn about your audience is the reconnaissance principle found in using the ABT as a story listening device. As Henner says, seek first to understand before being understood. When someone shares with you their problem, let them go on and on until they've exhausted their story. Then repeat back to them what you heard using the ABT framework. For instance, you could say, okay, you want this and it's important to you because of this, but you're frustrated because of this thing standing in your way. Therefore, imagine what it will feel like when you get it by doing this. You will build trust because you demonstrated that you listened, leveraging the reconnaissance principle with your storytelling skills. Mark Twain said, if God intended us to talk more than listen, he would have given us two mouths and one ear. You can explore all 32 of the storytelling principles in my post. Again, check it out. The link is in the show notes. In essence, my book, Brand Bewitchery, is the jiu-jitsu guide to brand storytelling. So today we pick up with chapter three of Brand Bewitchery, where you will learn how to make your brand stories land right the first time, every time. How? By understanding what's at stake for your customers, your colleagues, and the communities you serve relative to your brand offering. That's right, you're gonna use the reconnaissance principle to truly understand what they emotionally wish for to achieve that, that feeling, that sense of excitement, that optimism, and what physically they are willing to buy, either a product or service to help them fulfill that wish. I mean, after all, all of us brands are in the wish granting business. So what do you say? Let's get after it with this special edition of the Business of Story, chapter three of Brand Bewitchery called Stakes. Chapter three. Stakes, how to connect with the wishes and wants of your customers. Quote, when a person really desires something, all the universe conspires to help that person to realize his dream. Paulo Coelho. Answer me these questions three. You are investing valuable time and money to clarify your brand's story. What's at stake is the power that comes from a focused narrative. 
In this chapter, you'll learn what's at stake for your customers. It's important because knowing what motivates them informs what brand story you tell to trigger their will to act. But as with all hero journeys, there's a threshold guardian in the form of doubt that appears at this point to test your resolve. The threshold guardians that appear in the stories we love are metaphors for the forces of life that punch us in the nose whenever we want something, just to test us on how badly we want it. Think of Miracle Max in one of my favorite movies, The Princess Bride. Billy Crystal plays a threshold guardian who tests Ingo Montoya on his quest to avenge his father's death. The Wizard and the Wizard of Oz who tests Dorothy's medal is another threshold guardian. And who can forget the guardian of the Bridge of Death and Monty Python and the Holy Grail? Stop! Who approaches the Bridge of Death must answer me these questions three. The questions three at this stage of the story cycle system that help define the emotional and material stakes of your heroes, their quests are, number one, how do your customers wish to feel? Number two, what do they want to purchase to fulfill their wish? And number three, which stories trigger their will to take action? The best way to understand the wishes and wants of your customers is to first try these questions on yourself. I will play the threshold guardian and ask you to answer these three questions before you can proceed. How do you wish to feel? Think of your wish in question one as what you seek emotionally, how something will make you feel. Philosophically, what do you want out of a relationship with your brand? With your brand storytelling, do you wish for to feel understood and accepted? Realize peace of mind as an entrepreneur? Experience the exhilaration of fast growth. Be confident you're on the right journey, heading in the right direction. Be attractive to the best talent. Elevate your purpose by engaging others. Build trust among all those you serve. Be appreciated for your beliefs and values. Look smart. <laughs> Don't discount this last one. Your wish is what sets every story in emotion. Just ask Walt Disney. Disney created a ubiquitous brand that fulfills wishes. Sing with me. When you wish upon a star, what do you want? Think of your want, question two, as the physical product, service, or experience that will fulfill your wish. Unlike your internal wishes, wants are the external measures defined as both a course of action to achieve a particular purpose and how you quantify your success. For example, you may wish to feel the exhilaration of driving a sporty car, so you want a red Tesla. Coca-Cola, on the other hand, may appeal to your wish for the momentary happiness of a sweet, fizzy jolt, which makes you want their cola. E-Trade targets customers who wish to feel in control of their investing and therefore want its online service. I wish to look smart and be insightful about the power of storytelling and branding, but many logic-driven executives push back, discounting stories' impact on their business. Therefore, I want to show them the return on investment of our proven storytelling framework to engage their people in a brand-driven storytelling enterprise. When they witness the ROI of storytelling, they'll think, hey, he's pretty smart. My wish is fulfilled as is theirs, which is to perhaps be viewed as innovative or bold or wise. You may wish to be the storytelling wizard in your workplace, but you want to demonstrate your success through a demonstrable ROI. So before we can grant the wish, we need to look at the want to help ourselves overcome the threshold guardian of doubt. Which stories trigger your will to act? The third question to consider after identifying your prospect's wish and want is which stories you will tell to trigger their will to act. I've learned with the business of story that some of my most effective stories focus on the ROI of storytelling. What I can illustrate a significant return on investment for my prospect's work with business storytelling, it incites them to act. We will talk about will triggers in greater detail in Chapter 4 called Disruption. So in this journey to clarify your brand story, how do you wish to feel? What do you want to achieve from this book? And what will motivate you to continue moving forward even when some of the exercises feel like they're pushing back on you? Perhaps your motivating force is the return you will earn 
on the investment of your time in the story cycle system. The ROI of storytelling versus the threshold guardian of doubt. On September 20th, 2018, I was at the lectern in the Phoenix Art Museum addressing more than 400 local business leaders on behalf of Goodwill of Central and Northern Arizona for its fourth annual Empower Breakfast. GCNA sought to increase its donations at the fundraiser by 30% from the previous year. So they designed the event with storytelling at its core. I was the final speaker, following empowering stories by its leadership. My job was to make, quote, the ask, unquote. So I shared a simple anecdote with the audience. When I was 12 years old, I told them, I was digging fence posts with my brothers on the 12-acre home we grew up in in the Pacific Northwest. Like you, the audience was probably thinking, where in the hell is this going? My dad, a civil engineer and president of Constructors Pamco, a heavy construction company in Seattle, swung into the driveway on a drizzly Wednesday afternoon. When he got out of his car, I whined about having to build this cedar fence. He simply looked at me and made a memorable point about outworking the competition. Quote, a guy might want to pick up that shovel or someone else will, end quote. Then he turned and walked away. It was the wisdom of a man who grew up in North Dakota during the Depression as the son of a lumberyard operator. That was the moment I understood the importance of a strong work ethic, I told the audience. Knowing smiles lit up the faces of these alpha executives. They too appreciated what a meaningful job can do for a soul. And that is exactly what GCNA provides through the workforce development programs we were asking the audience to invest in. What was at stake for Goodwill that morning was a fundraising goal of $200,000 to help put Arizonans back to work, but it actually raised $348,000, 75% above its goal. And that was $207,000 more than what they had raised during the same event before, more or less the same audience at the same place the year prior. Tim O'Neill, CEO of Goodwill of Central and Northern Arizona, credited the organization's intentional approach to brand storytelling for the fundraiser's success in generating an ROI 260% above the previous year. Wish fulfilled 10 times over. Did you feel it? Your threshold guardian of doubt just flinched. The emotion of brand storytelling might work in fundraising, but what about actual brand development? In a minute, I'll show you how it helped GCNA grow its annual revenue by more than 400%. But let's first take a look at how brand storytelling can make the most insignificant products sell more than 28 times their worth. Talk about ROI. Remember that you and I live in the land of abundance. Our products and services are all mere commodities unless we clarify our brand stories to make them stand out and mean more in the hearts and minds of our customers. A terrific example of brand storytelling ROI is found in the Significant Objects Project. In July 2009, Joshua Glenn, a cultural and brand semiotician, I had to look it up, but semiotician essentially means a sign guy, and Rob Walker, a journalist who writes on material culture, launched the Significant Objects Project. They wished to understand buying behavior relative to storytelling and wanted to publish a literary and anthropological experiment to objectively measure the effect of narrative on an object's subjective value. They purchased 100 tchotchkes, you know, knickknacks you can find in thrift stores like Goodwill, for an average of $1.25 a piece. Then they hired creative writers to attach a fictional story to each object and sold the items at auction on eBay. For example, they purchased this acrylic encased globe for $1.49. Guess what it sold for because of its story? $197.50. The Significant Objects Project tested the power of story to create meaning and money out of the mundane. Glenn and Walker invested a total of $128.74 for the first collection of baubles. Sold that collection for a combined $3,612.51 and created an ROI of 
percent. Quote, stories are such a powerful driver of emotional value that their effect on any given object's subjective value can actually be measured objectively. Joshua Glenn and Rob Walker. Their stories fulfilled the wishes of their customers to be moved emotionally, which created their want for the objects at what you might consider relatively obscene amounts of money. Yet the price was still so insignificant that it didn't take much to trigger the will to act. I, like millions of people around the world, fall for a story every day. I wish to express my individuality and creativity Therefore, I want an Apple computer to help fulfill this inner need to, quote, think different, end quote. I have to muster the will to part with the money, but that usually takes just some internal coaxing, perhaps in the form of one or two well-honed stories. What I stand to gain by making the investment, or perhaps what I stand to lose by remaining in status quo. FOMO, the fear of missing out, is a huge motivator to lots of people. I know, it seems shallow, but that's life as a socially driven storytelling monkey called Homo sapiens. If brand storytelling can bring a significant return on insignificant items, imagine what it will do for you and your exceptional product or service. The cost of not developing your storytelling culture. Let's talk for a moment about the growth of your own people. What's at stake for them philosophically and physically? Are the wishes of your leadership, staff, and employees being fulfilled by living into your brand story? What happens when they haven't bought in yet due to the confusion about your vision and mission, which have been weakened and distorted by a convoluted narrative? What are the threshold guardians of doubt your people are confronting? While not every story will be as bullish as the stories I described above, you still cannot afford to ignore investing in storytelling within your organization. Susan Heathfield, a sought-after human resources expert by entities such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, and NPR, is a top management and organization development consultant and co-owner of TechSmith Corporate, a software development firm with more than 280 employees. According to her, among the top concerns employees have is their relationship with their boss and colleagues a consequence of the lack of interpersonal communication inherent in large companies. But what does that mean? I went to the 2017 Employee Engagement and Retention Statistics Report by Access Perks and pulled some of the startling findings. By the way, this is one of the few times in the book I'll pepper you with bulleted numbers, but only because I set their context first through telling you stories. I'm a big believer that PowerPoints riddled with bullets kill presentations. The same is true with books. Oh, and I'm going to give you the barrage of bullets all at once just to get it over. Lucky you. Bullet number one. 51% of the U.S. workforce is not fully engaged in their work, which means their employer is not fully realizing their potential contributions to productivity, culture, revenue, and profits, according to Gallup. Bullet two, disengaged workers cause massive losses in productivity between 450 and 500 billion a year, according to Mental Health America. Bullet number three, only 16% of employees said they felt connected and engaged by employers, according to Employee Channel. And finally, 78% of employees who say their company encourages creativity and innovation are committed to their employer according to report Linker. Employees are an appreciating asset, meaning they produce compounding value to the organization over time. So losing them is quite costly. Josh Burson of Burson by Deloitte in an article on employee retention outlined the following factors a business should consider in calculating the real cost of losing an employee. Bullet one, the cost of hiring a new employee, including advertising, Interviewing, screening, and hiring is expensive. The cost of onboarding, training, and management time is expensive. Lost productivity. It can take a new employee up to 24 months to reach the productivity of an existing person. Lost engagement. Fellow employees who see high turnover often disengage and lose productivity. Customer service issues. New employees take longer to assist customers. 
are often less adept at solving problems and tend to make more errors. Training cost. A business likely invests 10 to 20% of an employee's salary or more in training over their first two to three years. Cultural impact. Whenever someone leaves, others wonder why, which distracts them from their job at hand. Finally, wisdom withdrawal. Long-term employees who decide to leave the company take loads of historical knowledge with them, creating an insight and expertise void for the new employees. What is business storytelling worth to you? Airbnb CEO Brian Chesky said, quote, people remember the magic of an experience, end quote. Stories are always about experiences, those moments of surprise that lead to clarity and understanding. Your people love business points that are illustrated through drama, not data. By the way, Airbnb is worth more than $24 billion. Tony Shea, founder of the online shoe company Zappos, which sold to Amazon for north of $900 million, said, quote, A great brand is a story that never stops unfolding, end quote. Zappos hosts a special website, zappoinsights.com, where their employees share stories that power their culture. As the company grows, so do their stories. Legendary entrepreneur Sir Richard Branson of Virgin fame said, quote, The Virgin story, its ups, downs, opportunities, and the challenges is what attracts people to its products and services, as well as attracting employees to join the Virgin family. We would be nothing without our story, end quote. What kind of stories will you share to connect with what's at stake for your internal audiences, their wishes and wants? Here are a few good ones to consider. Your origin story. Share the moments that have informed who you are today and why your brand does what it does in the world to enroll your people in a crystal clear vision. How about your quest story? Align your people with your focused mission. Your transformation story. Share when a significant change in strategy is afoot. Your in a whole story. Talk about something unanticipated that has happened and how you plan to climb out of the hole. Your they're just like me story. Share a case study of someone who wished for and wanted the same thing as your audience. Detail what triggered their will to act and the resulting outcome. These stories are not long-winded epic adventures, but short stories that deliver a big impact. They use the five primal elements of an anecdote that we will discuss in Chapter 7 called Journey. Suffice it to say, at the core of brand leadership training is communication through storytelling. A story clarifies a situation, illuminates the way forward, and connects with the primal wishes and wants of your audience, triggering their will to act. What other business asset can you count on for a 10 plus percent return on your investment? So far in this chapter, we've demonstrated a 100 percent plus return on storytelling and fundraising, a 10 plus percent return on employee retention and motivation. But how about brand building? This guidebook is filled with examples of how brands have achieved exponential growth by clarifying their stories. Let's take a look at Goodwill of Central and Northern Arizona again for another example. Brands are in the wish-granting business. Understanding what's at stake for your audience, what they wish for and want, is critical for you to get them to buy into your brand's story. In 2003, when I was running my agency, Park & Co., Goodwill of Central and Northern Arizona asked our team to help freshen their 80-year-old brand in Metropolitan Phoenix. The organization was generating $17 million in annual revenue through 24 thrift stores. That revenue funds workforce development programs that help Phoenicians find jobs. When we began rewriting its brand story, Goodwill had trained more than 4,000 people that year and placed 885 individuals in jobs throughout Metropolitan Phoenix. But the most critical first step we had to take after understanding their unique brand position in the marketplace was to understand and appreciate the wishes and wants of their core audience, Goodwill shoppers. We studied the customer persona of their shoppers and found a fascinating group whose story would be fun to tell. We called them, quote, soccer mom closet shoppers, end quote. These are women who love to unearth retail treasures but are reluctant to reveal their thrift store loot. 
We learn that they are typically very social moms with household incomes of 50000 plus, and they share a fear of what their friends, who frequent swinkier stores, might think of their second-hand shopping habits. I know this closet shopper woman well. She's my wife, Michelle. One night, while I was working on Goodwill's initial brand story strategy, Michelle sprang into our living room clutching a Goodwill bag and sat down close to me. It was just the two of us. She slipped a beautiful robin's egg blue blouse out of the bag and in a secretive voice said, You can't believe it, but I just bought this $150 Nanette Lepore blouse at Goodwill for $6. I replied, That's great, honey, but why are you whispering? She shrugged and giggled at her score, but I knew why. Michelle is our target audience. Shoppers like Michelle wish to express their unique creativity by displaying unexpected and unusual finds in their home and on themselves. They want these items to be one-of-a-kind totems of their individuality. Price and savings are not the drivers, but the bonus. However, the fear of these shoppers is appearing cheap, so they go about their thrift store adventures quietly. Her unfounded fear of being branded with the scarlet letters of thrift store shopper is based on the obstacles the thrift industry itself perpetually has to overcome. Those antagonistic threshold guardians include the perception of dirty stores, messy aisles, tattered clothing, and what some might regard as questionable patrons without much money. But these closet shoppers are responsible for a good deal of thrift retailers' income as compared to that derived from needier shoppers. That's why this is an important market to empathize with and tap into. I know that positive sentiment for thrifting has grown over the past 16 years, but back in 2003, it was still considered gauche by many consumers. So before our team could craft a new brand story, we asked GCNA to begin living it by cleaning up their stores. They fixed light fixtures, painted walls, tidy dials, and expanded their inventory so more treasures could be discovered. In some stores, we even suggested moving the coffee maker to the front to help mask that exotic scent of thrift. Then we created a 30-second TV commercial that featured our hero, the closet shopping soccer mom, stealthily flowing through the aisles, collecting her treasures. But then she runs into her friend at the front of the store. Neither of the ladies wants to admit they're shopping at Goodwill, so our leading lady says she's just dropping off donations as she places her newly purchased items in the donation bin. Her friend also pretends she's just dropping something off, and once they say their goodbyes, she slips back into the store to shop. When the coast is clear, our first mom darts back in to collect her purchased items. She pretended to donate and dashes out of the Goodwill store with a big smile. We close with the title card, Good Stuff, Good Work, Goodwill. We outed the soccer mom, and in doing so, we connected with this shopper on her terms, demonstrating understanding and empathy for her wishes. GCNA was concerned that the commercial would look like they were making fun of their shoppers, especially the shy ones. In fact, GCNA told us that if this didn't work, we'd be fired. This had the markings of a short love story indeed, but we felt in our heart of hearts that this tale of the treasure hunter's journey would resonate with their customers. It took courage from everyone to tell a story that underscored the basic truth of these unique value shoppers. Quote, be proud of who you are, end quote. This approach to customer-centric storytelling came in many forms over the subsequent years, leading GCNA's 400% growth. By 2017, GCNA had grown beyond 90 stores and generated more than $162 million in total annual revenue to power their mission of providing quality services and programs. They served more than 105,000 people and placed more than 45,000 individuals in jobs throughout the Phoenix community. Nationally, the goodwill narrative has changed over the years from one of a secondhand industry to a story about celebrating the thrift store phenomenon. That's what authentic, well-lived, and well-told storytelling can do for the character arc of a brand. But first, you must understand and empathize with the wishes and wants of your customer 
so you can overcome their threshold guardians and trigger them to act. The wishes and wants of your brand. Before you consider the wishes and wants of your audiences, I want you to first consider what's at stake for your brand. What do you wish for and what measures do you want to make happen to grow your organization, your people, and the communities you serve? Then consider the same goals for the three audiences you developed in the previous chapter. What do they wish for that makes them want your product or service? For instance, my wish for the business of story is to feel vital. To feel vital means that you, as one of our customers, understand that storytelling engages people. You recognize the usefulness of Business of Story's proven frameworks to get your people on board with your clear mission. You appreciate how a well-crafted narrative will build your personal brand, your business, and your team. And you've discerned how our deliberate practice program can create more effective and empathetic communicators. Plus, you seek an impressive ROI with performance-driven outcomes that include growing your personal influence, enrolling your people in a common mission, aligning priorities, and building trust in a journey that your people can buy into and prosper from. To fulfill my wish of being vital, I want you to invest in our eight-week deliberate practice program. Plus, I want you to invite me to speak at your events and work with your people to connect them to the power of story. I want you to appreciate how you will experience the measurable value of enhanced creativity, more persuasiveness, increased collaboration, greater adaptability to people, problems, and opportunities, and even improved time management skills. I wanted you to buy this guidebook, and you did. Thank you. Now I wish to hear about the value you have received as you clarify your brand story to amplify your impact and simplify your life with the story cycle system. Why? Because then I'll feel smart. Actually, it's more than that. I will feel fulfilled that you have benefited from the applied science and bewitchery of storytelling as I and thousands of leaders have. Let me further illustrate this in terms of Business of Story's three main audiences. The table on the next page shows what I've come to learn that our audiences wish for and want from their brand storytelling development and what triggers their will to go for it. Target audience number one, founder, CEO of an emerging enterprise. You wish to feel confident and optimistic in the growth and direction of your organization and not be frustrated by its lack of focus. You'll want a proven brand story strategy system to help you clarify your narrative with metrics you can measure. Your will to act comes from your need to combat increasing competition that is taxing your organization's competency and survival at every level. Audience number two. Directors of Marketing, Sales, or Human Resources. You wish to feel trusted as a high-performing leader by getting your team to buy into a common purpose-driven brand narrative. You'll want a proven, measurable storytelling curriculum that will grow your team as confident and productive communicators. Your will to act comes from your need to overcome your competition that is using storytelling to gain a competitive edge over you and your organization. Target audience number three, the industrious executive. You wish to feel more respected and influential for the experience you have earned through a productive career. You'll want a proven way to capture and articulate your unique personal brand story to differentiate you from your competition. Your will to act comes from the fact that you don't have time for anything other than a career move that supports your core purpose as a professional and amplifies your impact. What's at stake for your brand and your audiences? As you craft your brand story strategy, you not only want to detail your audience's measurable short, medium, and long-term gains, but what their will is to actually fulfill their wish. By will, I mean the reason, the driving force that motivates them to act. In the hero's journey, Campbell calls this the call to adventure. So I will too. We'll cover how you can trigger their will to act in the next chapter. But for now, think about a story that they can buy into that nudges them to purchase your product or service. 
There are two kinds of stories you will tell to accomplish this, depending on how well you understand what makes your customers tick. Number one, what will they gain by buying into your offering? What story is that? Number two, what will they lose by remaining in status quo, doing nothing? I know what you're thinking. My product or service is so great and it's going to help them so much that I need to communicate how much better off they'll be just by using it. And that may be true for some audiences, especially those with a mindset of abundance and natural optimism. But it's been proven time and again that we homo sapiens are beset with a negativity bias, an internal mechanism that runs on autopilot to help ensure our survival. Studies have shown that we will work harder not to lose 100 bucks than to gain $100. So you might consider telling stories on what your audience will lose if they don't buy into your offering. As mentioned earlier, FOMO is a huge motivator. Is it FOMO that has driven you this far to clarify your brand's story and increase your storytelling capabilities? Or do you just naturally see the world through an empowering narrative lens and you want to build on that perspective? Connecting people through storytelling is hard. So what fuels my will to invest an enormous amount of time, money, and energy into building the Business of Story platform around the world? Quite simply, it's boredom. Boredom is my nemesis. When was the last time you were bored into buying anything? An innovative product or service? An important social initiative like diversity and inclusion? a critical sustainability mission, a forward-thinking vision? Never. If I can't excite and inspire people about how to make a positive impact in the world through the stories they tell, then status quo and boredom will win out. I simply can't have that. Boredom goes against every fiber in my being and runs counter to what turns out to be my personal archetype, the fool. No, that's actually a good thing, and I'll explain this in Chapter 6, called Mentor. Now it's your turn. First, fill out the wishes and wants of your brand. Then determine what customer you are selling to. How are you communicating your offering to increase their want of it? And what brand stories will ignite their will to act? How are you going to measure your ROI through short, medium, and long-term goals? Remember, while you wish to feel the confidence and influence that comes with wielding your storytelling capabilities, you'll want to measure the impact of the applied science and bewitchery of story on your business to demonstrate real ROI. This encourages your will to proceed. You sell to the wish by communicating your offering in a way that increases your customer's want. How? Through a story that stirs their will to act. Answer the wish, want, and will questions for yourself and brush aside your threshold guardian of doubt as you chart a clear course venturing into the next chapter. The ROI of your storytelling. What will be the return on investment for your brand storytelling? You must set your short, medium, and long-term goals so that you can measure your outcomes. I mean, even your purpose-driven brand is in the business of making money. Final thoughts. You are at the turning point between the first and second acts of the story cycle system. You've defined your number one position in the marketplace to declare how you are functionally different from your competition and therefore superior to them. You've prioritized your top three audiences. And now you've determined what's at stake for those audiences. What do they wish for and want to have to fulfill their wish? You have to set the context for your brand story. Now, in the next chapter, you will cause or embrace disruption in the world to become the most urgent and relevant offering for your customers. You will determine what will trigger their will to act and capture that sentiment in your unique value proposition. Ready to shake things up? Additional resources. If you would like a deeper dive into determining what's at stake for you and your audiences, then visit businessofstory.com forward slash stakes for these additional resources. Read volume three of the Business of Story online magazine, What's at Stake? Listen to TV producer Chapman Downs on the Business of Story podcast, How HBO's Real Sports Tells Stories on Purpose. 
and watch my quick explanation on how to determine your short, medium, and long-term goals at bit.ly forward slash story cycle dash stakes. Story on activity. Ask your spouse, partner, friend, or colleague what they truly wish for themselves in a specific area of their life. Then ask what they want to make happen to fulfill their wish. Is it the purchase of an item, service, or an experience? How does this purchase help them achieve their wish? Then consider something you wish for. What item, service, or experience do you purchase to uplift yourself, express your personality, and fulfill your wish? The addendum in this chapter is a list of adjectives that describe emotions from A to Z. Use them to determine what you and your audiences wish for. Thank you for listening to Chapter 3 of Brand Bewitchery. Please share this episode with anyone you know who would benefit by becoming a more confident and persuasive storyteller. Theme music is composed by Darius Holbert, community development by Marissa Hill, and the show is edited by Caden Howell. If I can help you and your team excel through the stories you tell, hit our contact page at businessofstory.com for information on in-person, virtual, and hybrid mastery courses, keynotes, and even do-it-yourself storytelling training. Please join us next week for Chapter 4 of Brand Bewitchery, Disruption, How Your Unique Value Proposition Will Win the Day. Until then, remember that the most potent story you'll ever tell is the story you tell yourself. So make that one epic. Thanks so much for listening.